speech by uh, Peter Fordham with an introduction from his uh, seat of uh, Brendan O'Brien. Now, he told me that his uh, favorite uh, radio program, I think it's also a podcast, is uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. It's a quiz show, which I agree is uh, very, very funny and worthwhile. Uh, and uh, so uh, next, Brendan will talk about what the uh, objectives are for the speech. Uh, he, he, it'll be eight to ten minutes. Yes, so the, the title is Lessons Learned the Hard Way. It's a, out of the manual speech, not a, but the project, just a manual. Um, uh, to, ent to entertain the audience and not use notes, and then I will make some general comments on specific <coughs> like structure, organization, delivery, and so forth. All right, very good. So let me introduce uh, Pete Fordham. So I'm going to try to talk with a plum. Brendan will tell me in a few minutes whether I did. <laughs> so over the course of our lives, we learn many lessons. Some we learn the easy way, and some we learn the hard way. And I'm going to share with you some of the lessons I've learned the hard way. When I was a kid, I grew up in Wayland. And at this point, I was maybe seven or eight years old. And my father, who was an attorney, and he had a client, General Electric. And his client was a man named Roland who lived in Melrose. And we used to go visit them. And we became good friends with his family. And I remember vividly, even though it was a long time ago, going to their New Year's party every year. All the kids would go down to the basement and we'd all watch, you know, football and, and the Rose Bowl and that sort of thing. Fast forward a couple of years. Roland was sitting in his dining room with his family, having dinner. And a sniper shot him through the back, through his dining room window. Killed him. Total chaos. No one knew who did it. No one knew whether the rest of the family was at risk. No one knew what had happened. The family came to live with us in Wayland with a 24-7 police guard for a week. Remember, I'm about eight years old. Scared the you-know-what out of everybody, particularly me. I'll give you another example. Again, I grew up in Wayland. There were, on, on my street, there were six boys that lived within about three houses of each other, and we used to pal around. One of them was a guy named Steve Mioli. M-E-O-L-I. You, you can Google him. When he was 18 years old, he was skiing in Vail, in Colorado, a great ski resort. And he was going up the mountain on the gondola, and the cable car he was on collapsed. And four people died, including Steve. So he died with no notice whatsoever. It just happened in both cases. Now, I certainly learned from both of those that you really have to take life seriously because you never know whether it's going to end tomorrow or whether it's going to end in 50 years. And that certainly made a huge impression on me. Years later, my wife and I lived in Acton. We bought a house and it had a septic tank. I'll tell you why that's relevant in a minute. Not usually the most exciting on top. So when we bought the house, you have to have a septic tank inspection. It's a health inspection. And the health inspector comes out, and the septic tank people who do all the work come out, and they do all the work to test it. And we passed with flying colors. Four years later, I went to sell it, and it failed the same test miserably. The same people were there. The same health inspector, the same company doing the work, the same people failed miserably. Why? because the septic tank was installed originally upside down and no one caught it. So we were furious, as you can tell. We went to the health inspector, he said, same guy who had approved it. He said, not my problem, you have to fix it. Went to the septic company. They, they've been cleaning our septic tank for the past four years. Not my problem, you know, don't, don't come to me. 
and the builder lived across the street. And I knew him a little bit. And I called him on the phone, and he hung up on me. And I went to his house, and he slammed the door in my face. We ended up fixing the septic tank. We were furious. I think now I would have handled things differently than I did then. But lesson learned, you can't assume that people will stand up for what they claim they do. The health inspector, what kind of health inspector is that? What kind of septic tank company you know, would, would not back you up? What kind of builder would not back you up? You have to assume that people may not back you up and may not be honest when you need it. Another example, back to Wayland. I'm in fifth grade. And my father was on the school committee. I'll tell you that why that's relevant. He was, we were, this is a long time ago, and we were, he was trying to make the switch from a junior high school to a middle school, which a lot of schools did at that time. This is back in the 60s. And I was in my class in the fifth grade at one point, and someone yelled, hey, there's this petition. Everyone come out in the hall. You need to sign it. It's a petition for the new middle school. I went, great. So I ran out into the hallway. And I, I wanted to be one of the first people to sign the petition. And I did. I was like number three on the list. A few days go by. My father comes up to me and he says, so, did you sign the petition? I said, yeah. It was a petition for the new middle school. He goes, no, it wasn't. I said, yes, it was. No, it wasn't. At the same time as that was going on, the, the new middle school, there was another teacher in another fifth grade class who had a male student who misbehaved and he beat him with an electrical cord in class. Oh, no. I had signed a petition to support Mr. McCain, the teacher who had done that, thinking that I had signed a petition for the new middle school. Lesson learned, never sign anything until you read it. <laughs> I was 10. Or 11. I just assume if someone told you that that's what it was, that's what it was. It wasn't. What happened is the petition went to the superintendent of schools, who knew my father because he was on the school committee, and he, and he gave it to my father. I was like number three on the list. And he said, Did your son mean to sign this? And he's like, I don't know. I'll find out. And that's how, that's how it happened. Move ahead to a recent example. Last week, my wife and I need new health insurance. We have COBRA and it expires the end of February. So I'm starting to look for new health insurance. Um, I went on the connector, you know, the state health website, looking for health insurance. And they were looking for some basic information, name, address, phone number, stuff like that. So I filled it out, clicked submit. But I wasn't on the connector. I thought I was, but I was on a bogus website. I immediately, within one minute, I'd given my cell phone number, started to get calls every five minutes for the next three days. The more numbers I blocked, the more numbers came through, just morphed to other numbers. So clear lesson there, make sure you are where you think you are. If you think you're on the Connect website, make sure you really are. And be very careful what information you give out, because they're still bugging the you-know-what out of me now. I gotta, I gotta, I'm getting less of them now, but it was literally every five minutes for three days, and they were bugging me. I didn't pick it up, because I knew they were scammers. It's pretty obvious. No one calls every five minutes for three days if, if they're not, if they're legit. And these people were not. Which leads me back to another example of, of people that are legit. You have to learn this. I, I might have mentioned this. Others, others of you might have heard this before. My father was the victim of several financial scams. And they took him for a lot of money. And this started to happen when he was 80 and above. They would call him and give him these cock and, cock and bull stories. And the ones you think no one would ever believe. But my father believes them. Believed because he passed away. And this happened twice. People would call him out of the blue and give him bizarre stories, and he would th and tell him he could make millions of dollars. All he had to do is start wiring money all over the place to all kinds of people for all kinds of things. And he believed it. And the more I told him it was fake, the more he told me I was an idiot. <laughs> and the more they would call him, and they would use 
fake phone numbers, fake names, from fake places, fake states. They were from Jamaica, all kinds of places. And it got to its worst. I mean, it was bad all, all the time, but he was in the hospital nearing his deathbed. And they figured out where he was, and they called the nursing station. And it was a woman, or someone posing as a woman. And she said, I need to talk to him. I'm his cousin from Tennessee. Trust me, he doesn't have any cousins from Tennessee. We only walked out because I was waiting by the elevator one day, and the elevator wasn't coming. And there was another woman standing there with me, and we ended up walking down the 12 flights because the elevator didn't come. It turned out she was the head of security for Brigham Women's Hospital. And she protected, I told her the story as we walked down the 12 flights, and she protected my father and the nurses and made sure those people didn't get back to him. But you can't assume that when people call you, tell you things, do things, in this day and age, you can't assume that any of it is real until you make sure. Because people these days will do anything. They'll do anything to take your money, to take your identity, to take everything. So I'm getting the red card. Lessons learned here. Um, Learn, learn from these lessons. That you, we all have these lessons in our life. Learn from these lessons, try to make sure they never happen again, and trust but, as Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify. I, these days my trust is very shaken. I don't really trust people until I can prove or they can prove that they should be trusted on the waterfronts. Thank you. Interesting speech, baby. The second speech is the icebreaker given by Johnny Vaughn. Uh, with speech objectives will be read by Bob Avalone. Um, Johnny uh, 